I'm JT Rogers, and I'm on my way late this morning to the apartment of John Weidman on the Upper West Side. And I have a lot of questions that I'm really excited to ask you. John Weidman is one of the greatest living book writers uh, in the American musical theater. And he's had a career that spanned uh, over 40 years. His first show out of the gate is a landmark American musical, which he did with Stephen Sondheim, uh, Pacific Overtures. And he is the author of Assassins and Contact, Anything Goes, and on and on. I probably came across John's work maybe 20 years ago. And it, it took a while to figure out that the same person had written such a diverse body of work. And that's one of the things that I admire so much about him. You have to look at John's whole body of work to see the voice of John Weidman, because show by show, he's absent. And like Yeats said about Shakespeare, his genius is that he leaves no fingerprints. One of the things I'm really keen to talk to John about is librettist as a job in the theater, because it really is one of those slightly mysterious positions. JT, Mr. Weidman. Good to see you. Great to see you, fella. Come on in. Thanks for having me over. A pleasure. And this was Pacific Overtures at the roundabout. It's a happiness at Lincoln Center at the Mitzi, where you obviously have Ugh, produced many times. Such a great theater. And behind you, anything goes yeah. from Lincoln Center? It's so great when you walk down the halls, down in the bowels, and to just see those posters. You can go, oh, I saw that, and I saw that, and I saw that. I'm always afraid when I go in that they will have painted over my shows and replaced them. I'm always with looking. Door. Where's mine? Did they throw yeah, it out? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's beautiful. Oh, you have to show me the books. I always like to see what is on somebody else's shelf. Well, this is, there's books everywhere. You know, the things that make their way onto these shelves tend to be books that have some personal connection. Sure. There's a Drunk Stone, Brilliant Dead, which is a book that came out recently. It's sort of a history of the National Lampoon magazine, which I was uh, heavily involved right. with we'll talk in about the beginning. That. Yeah. You know, and family pictures. There's me and my wife, my daughter and my son, and Bill Clinton. And, I've heard of him. And, yes. Yeah at yeah. the White House, and that was New Year's Eve when Y2K was supposed to destroy the world and didn't. <laughs> right. And, you know, and again, there are books here that, that either have some particular connection to me or the... These are your dad's yeah, books, my dad, right? Yeah, my dad was a novelist. No. Yeah. He worked in the theater briefly, but he wrote 32 published books. Wow. And um, I've got bound copies of them. They're sort of all over the apartment. And Interesting, you just said that your dad worked for about five years in the theater. Yeah. Because the sort of... Legend is that he, that you were a theater baby because of him, but that's not really the case. It's as far not. As I okay. mean, um, you know, I grew up in Southern Connecticut. Right. We moved into town when I was entering the eighth grade, which coincided with my father working on his first show, which was Fiorello, which was a big hit. Yeah, huge hit. Won the Pulitzer Prize. He then did two or three shows after that which were somewhat successful, then not so successful, then one that just wasn't successful at all. And he said, that's enough of that. And he just went back to, to writing novels. But I had this sort of electric experience of arriving in New York and being dropped into this glamorous world of the theater. But it was never any intention on my part, even then, that I really wanted to be part of it. So when I you started going to theater, you were going at your own volition, really? More yeah, yeah, I really, it was, you know, it was an interesting transition. I had kind of Little League and, and the backyard yeah. at the right age. And when Little League was over, I started to go see Morris Evans and Heartbreak House. I know? did the same thing. My mom says that I told her I wanted to be a baseball player or a writer, and she said I'd seen your ball playing. I said, maybe you should write. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Come on, let me show you what's in Thank the, you. the dining room here. Um, no books in the dining room. Okay. There are, I might as well get this oh, over with. Oh, wow. Kind of odd little. Good God, how many of these do you have? I have 19, <laughs> I think, maybe 20. <laughs> There was a period of time when I was writing screenplays. Yeah. But yes. they would, the movies wouldn't get made. Yes. And in the beginning, I didn't care. I was being flown first class to the coast and be put up at the Beverly Hills Hotel. But I came home one day feeling kind of glum and depressed. Another project had just stalled. And I came home, and my daughter was about two at the time. Yeah. And she was sitting on the couch watching Sesame Street. And I watched it with her, and I thought, you know, this is really witty. It's really well done, and it's worthy work. And if there was something that could create a kind of parallel path while I really 
devoted myself to working in the theater. Maybe this was a good idea. I auditioned for the show, and you sort of either get the sensibility or you don't, yeah. and I got it. And you worked there for a long time. Right? I had, yeah, I know I was part of the, the there's, there's not a writing staff there. There's a yeah. pool of writers, so I could always do a little bit of work or a little more work, and then you get to go to the studio and watch the Muppets perform your stuff, you oh, know? Great. And, I mean, having Jim Henson and Frank Oz perform your stuff is like having the best actors wow. in the world do it. And watching these guys was just thrilling. It was yeah, thrilling. And plus, I could take my kids. And, they could actually see that you did something. Well, and they could yeah. sort of understand it. I remember taking my daughter and saying, um, here's what Big Bird's going to say next. And then Big Bird would say, she said, how did you know that? I said, because I made it up. Come on, let's go ahead and sit down. I'll take your car. Great, we can great, great. Thank you. Things. So have a seat, get Thank comfortable. You, oh, for, uh, contact. That's the Hirschfeld from your... Yeah, it is. It was an opening night uh, present from Bernie and Andre. That's really it's cool. A, yeah, that's an Al Hirschfeld. So when you were going to the theater, when you had this period where you were sort of driven and seeing all these plays and sort of unbeknownst to you, getting in your blood, right. was there anything you saw that, looking back on it now, was crystallizing for you or was the moment that you... I think probably there was. I mean, I, you know, I uh, grew up in the 60s. And the boundaries between your personal life and your political life were more porous then mm. I, than they are, I think they are now, or they were for my kids. And um, I'd been going to the theater in New York ever since we moved into town, all the time. But in, I guess it was 69, I went to see The Great White Hope, Howard Sackler's uh, play. And yeah. um, I think I saw it three times after all was said and done. And I remember sitting there and just being electrified um, by the size of it, the sweep of it, th the way in which he was able to manage this intensely personal story at the center of this large political story. Well, it's almost like a musical, too. I, I think I, that's correct. And I think, you know, the fact that I wound up working in the musical theater in yeah. part is connected to the fact that the size of this, of this play really appealed to me. I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a particular scene early on, Jack Jefferson is fled to Europe and he's going to fight this Polish uh, uh, prize fighter. And when he comes downstage and he delivers, while well, he's sort of shadow boxing, a monologue in French. And if you were in the audience and you didn't understand French, you wouldn't really know what he was talking about, but it felt like a kind of an aria. It felt musical to me. The whole piece, the, the direct address to the audience, the whole thing felt like it was thrilling. And it represented it was familiar to me, but it also felt like he had sort of pushed this form into another place. It's so interesting you say that. That's the play for you, because if someone's looking at your body of work and knowing you some and looking back, it makes complete sense. One, it's a great play, but the overt political nature of the play, not as, a, as agiprop, but as no, it's a private story set against a large historical canvas, which is what your work is all about and which is what I admire and try to do my own work. Well, it, you know, I, Clearly, I've worked on things depending on who I'm collaborating with, which don't have that quality, and that's one of the it's one of the things that I actually I I like about working in the musical theater is collaboration. We'll talk about that. Yeah. But you adjust your ambitions in order to create the, a perfect match with the person you're working with, and you know I think the most political pieces that I've done have all been the pieces that I've done with Steve Sondheim, who when he is been working not working with you is not really working with not you. I mean, so he political. goes to a different place. Yeah, yeah. It's just like something happens between the two of us um, that's really comfortable and that's enormously, I think, enormously productive. The three shows you and Steve Son have done together, collectively, they make an incredibly detailed commentary about America, both socially and politically, well, while being hummable. The, I mean, three shows of Pacific Overture's Assassins and then Roadshow. And it was hard to get Roadshow finished. And yeah. Well, I'm sure we'll talk about that. But one of the things that was enormously satisfying to me about getting it finished was I did feel that w w it, it constituted the completion of a kind of boxed set mm. of pieces that the two of us had, had created together. And, um, you know, I'm a big admirer of the Coen Brothers movies because I feel like it's, it, they've created this body of work about America. Mm -hmm. And depending on which film you're looking at, you're looking at a different aspect of what they ha think about the country, you think about what goes on here. It's interesting you say that about the Coen brothers or just film in general, because w one of the things I've been struck by is your actual writing is very screenplay-like. The, the, mm -hmm. That its specificity and the terseness with which you're able to get across 
mood and plot. I think one of the obligations of, of writing a libretto, writing for the musical theater as opposed to writing a play, is for book writers, you really have to make your point and move on. You have to mm. make your point and move on. You cannot live too long in any particular moment in order to sort of expand and enjoy yourself. You know, you ultimately, you want the impact of the moment to occur inside the score. So that a lot of times, the conciseness, the terseness is about trying to prepare just enough for what's gonna happen in the song, but not to go past the point where you're actually delivering some of what is going to be delivered in the song. There's, there's nothing wrong with monologues in musicals, it seems to me, because they're sort of like numbers. Mm -hmm. But the obligation to be spare is a really important one. Yeah. So one of the things I want to talk about is just the role of the book writer. Because I think it's one of the last bastions of mystery left in our profession. Right. Mean, what do you do? And you know, I mean, even as a playwright and knowing you and knowing other book writers, there's still something that seems a bit more porous. Good musicals, it seems to me, require that kind of porous boundary between the person who writes the book and the person who writes the music and the lyrics. Yeah. I mean, my m best collaborations, the Assassins is a good example. Steve and I sat around and talked forever and forever and forever until it became embarrassing that neither one of us was writing. And then I went off and I did my part and he did his, started his part. Because I think the goal in the end is the show should feel as though it has all come out of the same pen. Uh, the lyrics should feel like they were written by the book writer. The book should feel like it was written by the lyricist and the music should feel like the two guys got together and did it that way. It's tricky for me to talk about because I've only written one play. But I do think that the fundamental task of the book writer is to, is to, is to be the custodian of the structure of the piece. The architecture in a sense. The architecture yeah. of the show. And I mean, in that sense, I guess it is like playwriting. People tend to equate dialogue with book, and that's not wrong because the book writer does write the dialogue, but the structure is, is really the essence of it. Contact, um, you know, which I sort of invented with Susan Stroman, you know, there were people who felt that, well, because there isn't a whole lot of dialogue, there, there isn't that much book. But all three parts of it are story-driven, and it's got as much book or more book than a lot of musicals where people talk all the time. One of the, thing about the things about the dialogue in contact, which is emblematic of, of what's required of a book writer, it seems to me, is that you have to create a language which would feel awkward in a play but which feels completely comfortable and natural, if not naturalistic, in a form in which people are actually at a certain point gonna stop talking and start singing. And um, it, as I say, it has to sound like you and me talking, but it can't sound right. like you and me talking. And that's, that's tricky and it's hard to get it right, but it's fun when you do. Is that something that you need to reinvent the wheel each time you're doing a musical, or is there a certain point you realize that th this is a kind of language that, while having to change, can go from show to show? No, I think you develop a, 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 a kind of a muscle memory of, of how to get it right. But um, if you write shows which are set in very different places at very different times with very different characters, these are not kitchen sink you know, melodramas, then each time you do have to find what sounds right to your ear and what's going to sound right to other people's ear. And when you write, do you write, where do you write? Do you, do you write, you know, I, I love have, all those, I yeah, love to no, ask no, other writers. I have questions. all my life, I have liked to, uh, I've enjoyed writing in libraries. Really? Yeah. For a long time I, I wrote at the library at the New York Historical Society because hmm. um, Lyle and I lived around the corner. There's a private library on the east side called the uh, New York Society Library which has big workrooms. I like to be in a large, open, quiet place so I don't feel claustrophobic with my own thoughts. And I like to be able to look up and be just distracted by somebody moving across the room so that I don't lose my train of thought, but I don't want to blow my brains out either. So. It's almost like you need just enough noise in, uh, on the dial and otherwise it's too much or too little. Yeah, it's like having a great view where there's a lot going on. And you can look up and you look at the view for a while and then you can look back at your keyboard. And do you write on a keyboard straight or do you start longhand? Uh, now I write on a keyboard. Uh, I used to, I could never compose on a typewriter. Uh, I wrote everything longhand, which is which I could do in a library, and then I would come back and type it up, yeah. and then I would edit it. Now I find that whether my thoughts are moving faster, I like to think that's what it is, but my handwriting can't keep up. And I'm, I also find that I'm able to be sloppy on a, on a computer 
in a way that I used to be on a yeah. yellow, yellow legal pad. Like it doesn't count. You just it sort of noodle put, it. You put things yeah. down, you move them around, you do stuff like that. I mean, I think some people um, miss typewriters because they have, they're have they allowed to be sloppy like that. You're not committing to what you're writing. But for me, that's a plus. I can make a mess and then I can sort it out afterwards. Yeah. Do you try to keep a routine, like a daily routine? or is it a... I've tried uh, for decades <laughs> and it's, uh, with no absolutely no success. I, I, people who get up in the morning and go to work are doing it, as far as I'm concerned, the right way. Yes. And I, I don't know. Really, there's sort of two camps of us. I think there's people, and there's less of this camp, I think, that those who do keep the schedule, so to speak, that actually keep it, don't just say that we do. Right. And then writers that, you know, and as a colleague, a friend once said, you know, that deadlines, there is no art, which I thought was the best. Yeah, just I mean, I hate, I hate deadlines, I hate them, but I also recognize that they're entirely essential. Yeah. Let me double back or, or rewind a little bit, because I think, to me, it's very interesting how you got into your first musical. So let's talk, yeah, which is, so okay. you go to Harvard. I do. Um, and you got your degree in Japanese history, is that correct? Yeah, I, I um, uh, Why everyone goes to Harvard? to pay that tuition to study Japanese history. To study Japanese history. I, you know, it, it's back to the, the 60s. When I was in high school, Asia, for all intents and purposes, did not exist, except when, in some weird way, it interacted, like in the Boxer Rebellion or uh, Pearl Harbor. And um, when I got to Harvard, and you had to take one course outside your book, yeah. they had a great East Asian studies department. And I, so I took the survey course in East Asian history, and every day was like, I'm gonna make myself sound like the student of the year, but it was like, wow. And then you go to Yale Law. Correct. And the reason I ask you about it is, do you think that that introduced you into a more nuanced idea of how power operates, political power operates, and how things get done than most of us get? Because I can see echoes of that in your work, and I'm wondering if you think that's conscious or it's just you picked that up other places. I think that Yale was a place where you could take a course, aside from contracts and torts and all the other stuff, you could take a course like, which I did, the, the Law of American Slavery. So that it wasn't just a narrow trade school, and everybody seemed to be wrestling with these kinds of issues at that time. And Nixon was bombing Cambodia, and so what was happening outside school was all over the school all the time. And um, so, I mean, I, you know, when I decided I didn't want to be a lawyer, but I wanted to stay in law school. What could I do while I was in law school that might provide another path? And I decided to sit down and write something. The fact that it had a political base, I don't think was surprising. So you sit down to write something, mm -hmm. and you choose a play. Why? Uh, well, <laughs> I, I, I... Why would you do that? Why, 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 do why that? how foolish of you? Y yeah. yeah I mean, no argument for <laughs> me, okay? I mean, and, and with in retrospect, it's like, really? That's yeah. in, but what I did was... Um, as I said, I said, I don't want to be a lawyer. And I wasn't committed to the idea of being a writer, but I sent a couple of letters looking for another life. One was to Bowie Kuhn, the commissioner of baseball. And I said, you know, I'm a law student. Do you have internships? And I got a form letter back saying no. And the other one was to Hal Prince, who I had met when I was a kid, because my dad had done a show with Hal. And, the, and Hal was the great, at that time, you know, a legendary Hal theater had, producer. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when I, when I was in college, I'd gone to see Cabaret and. And he and Steve had already done Company, Follies. And so that electric collaboration between these two guys was really what was driving the musical theater. And I was a fan. I was a huge fan. So you wrote him a letter. I wrote him a letter with asking him the same disingenuous question I asked Abu. And I got the same response. No, I don't have internships. But in the, I, I appended a PS, which said, but by the way, said, I'm, you know, I have an idea for a play about the opening of Japan about Perry's expedition to Japan. I'd love to, you know, talk to you about it sometime if that's possible. And he responded almost immediately, and he said, uh, as I said, no internships, but next time you're in New York, arrange to come in, and I'd love to talk to you about that idea. Most producers, yeah. Pick any producer saying, I'm writing a pad at the opening of Japan. The response is, lose my phone number. But And had uh, you written it at this point, or you just had the idea? I had kind of outlined it and started yeah. to think about it. But I went in. I went in and I had a conversation with Hal, enormously stimulating. And um, he said, go away and write it. And um, I did. 
And I sent him the play, and I waited a long time to get a response from him. But he responded really positively. And it's like he said, I want to do this. Wow. Um, I wasn't sure what that meant. I didn't want to take him at face value. But, it, you know, we did a reading. He still wanted to do it. And then he started to cast it. And honestly, I, late, years later, I found the play, and I read it, and I thought, you know what? I sort of caught a break when Hal decided... I don't think this will work as a play. It ought to be a musical, because that's the moment we arrived at. In the casting process, I mean, he was, you, we were, the ball was rolling, and he changed his mind? Um, the way I remember the story, Hal might remember it differently, was that Hal worked with Boris Aronson. Boris was mm. his main designer. Boris was brilliant. Yeah, you know, one and, of the great set designers. One ever. of the, gra the great ever. set designers. Yeah. And, and, an, and an extraordinarily generous and gracious man. But... He apparently could not figure out how to design the play. He was having trouble figuring out how to design the play. And to Hal, that was like a, a an alarm bell. That's exactly right. I was like, eh. And so when Hal said, I think this ought to be a musical, what I heard was, I'm not going to do your play. And, so you um, thought, I'm crushed, it's over, I'm done. Yeah. 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 And, and um, you know, he sent it to Steve. And um, it took him a while, but he... he persuaded Steve that it was a good idea. And then the three of us started to meet, and then I went away and started writing again. And so did you Steve. radically change the story? I mean, it's such a, I don't know of another example of that, where you're taking a, a play yeah. that really is finished. I mean, I suppose, you know, one answer is the play became the first act of the musical, uh, but um, I don't know that anybody other than me would absolutely recognize the play in the first act because the shape of the show was changing. It opened up and moved in a different direction. Well, I, I was talking to Steve about you and about the show, all your collaborations last week, and he, his memory is that it was your idea to, to, I guess you put it, to flip the gaze so that we, the audience, it's as if we are Japanese. Was that one of the clicks for you that said, oh, okay, now I, I know how we can tell this story? It was, but how from the beginning, as a director, was really interested, and I think this may have been the first thing that sort of turned hell on, was interested in the idea of combining American musical theater techniques with the techniques of kabuki theater. That you could make a marriage there. That mm -hmm. would be really interesting. That there was a there was a way that movement and music used in that form of Japanese theater that would blend well with what was happening you know, on stage at the Winter Garden. Yeah. And when Hal and I talked about that, those conversations resulted in the story turning Turning around. that way, yeah. Um, and honestly, it's the essential thing which is fascinating about the show. And I also think that um, if it were 20 years later, and if I had had more experience, I would have resisted the idea because I would have felt that there was a, a arrogance in assuming that we could adopt that perspective or that point of view and deliver it with, I'm avoiding the word authenticity because sure. it couldn't be authentic, but with, with a kind of accuracy that would make the evening interesting. So you do this strange, in quotation marks, piece. You go back and down and look at the response and it was, wow, this is amazing. I'm not sure I like it, but it's kind of amazing. It's weird, but okay. Yeah. And you get all these Tony nominations, you included, and it's your first show. Did you have the sense of, you know, the, what am I going to do next? And then, you know, th because I'm sure like you, like all of us, you're constantly working on something, and, and then you've got these years go by. Yeah. And then... It's like, oh, so I did Pacific Overtures. At the same time, you know, two guys who were good friends of mine from Harvard had started the National Lampoon magazine. And I'd been a major contributor to the magazine from the beginning. And before Saturday Night Live arrived, it was the hippest place to write comedy. And so... I was writing for the Lampoon, and I was working on a new show, and I was kind of, I was kind of pursuing these parallel paths. And Animal House came out in 1978, and all of a sudden, a half dozen of us who wrote the magazine became screenwriters. We didn't know how to write screenplays, but viewed from the West Coast, it was like, well, maybe lightning could strike twice, give him a job, you know? And so I wrote three or four screenplays over the course of several years. And, um, uh, I mean, uh, <laughs> John Hughes and I wrote the the sequel to Animal House, which I I believe is the last unproduced screenplay that John Hughes ever wrote. Hughes went on to make movies. I came back to New York and did what I was doing here. And, and I, you know, I came home from a, um, a another sort of misbegotten movie adventure, sat down next to my two-year-old daughter who was watching Sesame Street, 
and made a connection and there, exactly which became a kind yeah. of a parallel path to my career in theater. But, you know, there's a there were a, one or two shows I did done at the Hartford Stage, done uh, down at Coconut Playhouse. I was kind of figuring out actually how to do what I had already done on Broadway. I was kind of l learning on the job. I was teaching myself um, more of what I needed to know to be a, a successful book writer. And then your next show, which was going to be called the re, not the reinvention of anything goes, but the re. It was what's the phrase you guys. Well, used? it was a revival, but it was a restoration with an asterisk. I mean, the 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 show had been produced in 1934. There had been an off Broadway revival in 1962. It talked about porous. The show had enormously porous boundaries. Songs had moved in and out of it, and for that reason, among others, there had never been a first class revival of the show since 1934. Tim Krause and I acted as if we had been summoned to fix the show. But fixing it mostly involved two things. One, pacing it and rearranging it and adjusting it so that it would feel to an audience in 1988 as if it was a contemporary musical, but also feel as though it had been entirely written in 1934. One of the things that we did do is to gather together all the Cole Porter stuff which had been drifted out of the show and bring it back in. And the other thing I think we did successfully was to take songs which had not functioned really as book songs, they just sort of studded the story as it went along in 1934, and where we could, we converted them into book songs as best we could. Yeah. Uh, so that it would feel as though the score was driving the story forward as opposed to simply being interruptions. And it was know. a massive hit. Now, what a does that hit, mean? A, I, listen, I'm not, we're not talking about Wicked here or yeah. Phantom of the Opera. We're talking right. about something that ran for a, a couple of years, which was a hit in yeah, 19 incredible. But it provides a, a kind of embrace yeah. that is uh, a rare thing for, for playwrights. Yeah, for anybody, so. you know, it's a rare thing. Yeah. So soon thereafter, the next major show you did was, was Assassins. Assassins. I went to Steve and I had a different idea for a show. I wanted to write a musical about the Paris Peace Conference in 1919. But Steve said, well, I don't know. It seems like a movie. What do you think about this, Assassins? And I was like, well, uh, say some more, <laughs> you know? And he described to me this thing that decorated with appearances by historical assassins, John Wilkes Booth, uh, Leon Cholgash. And one of the things I discovered as we talked was that I was 17 years old when Kennedy was shot. And it was the first real experience that I had had of loss. It's hard to convey to people what Kennedy meant to a kid in those days. My grandparents were alive. And I got on a train, I went to DC, I stood on the sidewalk as the funeral cortege went by. And I realized as we continued to talk about assassins that Kennedy's assassination never made sense to me. It's like. You know, you get this one little angry man in Dallas, Texas, could create this extraordinary worldwide suffering and grief. And one of the things that was true of this collection of people who had attacked the president in American history was that globally they had been treated as if they had nothing to do with each other and nothing to do with the rest of us. It was as if the presidents had been struck by lightning. And so as Steve and I talked, I thought, let's but let's pull these people together and kind of set them in motion and get them talking to each other. These people were perceived as being isolated, you know, the loners. Yeah. And the idea was to sort of separate them like a break shot on a pool table and then let them live inside their own worlds and then discover each other until as a result of these interactions, they reach a moment where they each has tried to kill the president and they kind of look at each other and go, oh, you know what? It's not just me, you're, I'm like you, and you're like me, and we're a group. So did you go and, st because, you know, reading the libretto, what's marvelous about it is how lightly the erudition is worn of, of the research and the sort of weaving together of, of history and politics and occurrences. And, yeah. and did you start that early on, or was it, is that the sort of thing where you really, you're rolling for a while before you start really I knowing did, what to I research? did a bunch of reading about John Wilkes Booth and a bunch of reading about Lee Harvey Oswald. There wasn't a lot to read about the other people. But while Steve and I were talking, I was kind of sucking this stuff up to see what, where, where it might lead us. 
And, uh, but, you know, th there was this one book where this guy pulled all these people together and it contained this sort of four or five page little biographies of them that was enormously useful. And in most cases, it was enough information. The piece is not um, a documentary. Um, part of the intention was to absorb who these people seem to have been and then to reinvent them. Just as a writer, what I liked about the show is it, it allowed me, for all kinds of reasons, it had to do with sort of knocking the audience off balance in a good way. Um, there's a variety of styles that this sort of boundary structure permitted. Yeah. You could write, could write a scene, I thought, and I think I'm right, where Sarah Jane Moore and, and um, Squeaky From try to assassinate Gerald Ford. But it's like a Saturday Night Live sketch. Yeah. Like they're hopeless. Um, and and but but bump it up against the very naturalistic scene in which Leon Cholgash is waiting to talk to Emma Goldman about how lost he is inside yeah, his life. It was a, it was a, it was a, the most satisfying writing experience I've ever had. And that, you know, you talk about the 18 minute scene at the end, only, only with somebody like Steve, you know, could you do this. Most musicals, in order to, to build tension and emotion at the end, yeah. layer the music. I mean, the end of Sweeney Todd is almost unendurable and it just becomes, yeah. but in this case, given who these people were, and the claustrophobia of their lives, dropping the music out at a certain point, and we never discussed this, but it was just, it felt like that actually created a tension and a, and a kind of build and a kind of dread that m music would have... Dissipated. It would have dissipated, it would have bled off the edges. Well, you, it's, you know, building all the way to that final moment of watching Lee Harvey Oswald prepare to shoot, and I hadn't thought of it this way until you're describing it, but it's uh, they just the silence of it. It is, gets, is just so. gets tighter and tighter. Although there are, you know, at a certain point in that scene, uh, Booth has done everything he can to try and persuade Oswald to shoot yeah. Kennedy, and he hasn't quite made the case, and he asks for help, and Giuseppe Zangara steps forward and it speaks in mellifluous Italian, which is translated by the others. And that has a kind of a musical, without violating the rules of the uh, scene, yeah, interesting. it has a kind of a musical quality to it so that in 18 minutes is all the time in a, in a musical to have nothing that feels musical. And that always feels to me as though we're helping the audience at that point. You're changing, relax, you're, also, but you're changing. Change the tempo in a change way the tempo. Yeah, what you've got to do is writer, you know, back and forth, yes. sort of keep the audience focused. Yeah. And when the show came out, you guys were gutted like a bluefish. We I mean, were, it was just we brutal. The critics didn't just dislike the show, they were angry. And often audiences were as well. It, you know, until people were familiar with the show and had lived with the score for a few years, um, I think we, we, I don't think we were asking too much of them, but I think what we were asking of them was something that they resisted. And the fact that at no point somebody on stage announced to the audience that it's bad to shoot the president meant that you must have maybe we're being frivolous right. and we felt that this, this is, you know, you, you could write a show about anything, including shooting the president. And I mean, to write a show to tell the audience that it's bad to shoot the president seemed to us like a waste of our time and a waste of the audience's time. We were aiming for something um, uh, that we thought would be more provocative and, and send people out thinking. Thinking. And at the time, were you prepared but not that prepared? Were you shell-shocked? What, what was your uh, response? You know, um, you become, you, you live in, you know, you live inside what you're creating, and if you believe in it, you think other people will as well. And then it was a huge hit when it was revived again eight, seven, eight years ago at the Roundabout. It was done at the Roundabout. It was great, Joe Mantello's yeah, terrific really production. production, got really good reviews. So, you know, I'm very proud of the show, and I think it's the best thing I've ever written, and it's the best collaboration I've ever had on something. It still is rejected by all kinds of people, you know, um, but it's it it's found its place. Speaking of hits, of Weidman hits, let's talk about another sh really successful show and a really interesting show, uh, Contact, which you do with yeah. Susan Stroman. Yeah, <laughs> they're but standalone. They're, they're standalone pieces. pieces that at the same time are thematically connected and have a build to them. And the first piece is about sort of casual contact that satisfies everybody, because it's basically sexual, but it's paper thin. And the second piece is about somebody who's sort of yearning for contact and can't achieve it and is left in despair at the end of the at intermission. And the third piece is about somebody who's in despair 
and figures out how to make contact with somebody else and essentially saves himself. And so that's what we send people out with at the end. And when we described it to people, we said, well, it was written in dialogue and dance. And Stroh's choreographer's credit is up at the top where the Rodgers and Hammerstein credit would go, as yeah. if she had written the score, because it is that, there's that kind of balance, you know? Well, it's, it, it's interesting. Both she and Steve talked about working with you and both talked about you're always looking, continuing coming back to the big picture, which is one of your great strengths as a writer. And Steve says that you're a canvas painter that paints scenes and you're interested in groups, be they political, be they dancers. And, and it's interesting how they both saw, see that in your work and they both talk about this sub, subhuming of your ego that you're just there to move the material along and it's not about you, it's about, well, how are we gonna serve the story? Yeah, it's, you know, I, I, I mean, I talked earlier about, about I'm, I'm, I've been really lucky in my collaborations and the, the two primary collaborations have been obviously, you know, with Steve. But, you know, Stroh and I have worked together two or three times and, um, the emotional world in which contact lives is very different from the emotional world in which in which assassins live. But I feel like if you find somebody with whom you sh you share a, a common ambition, even if it's yeah. not articulated, you feel it and you go with that. In the second major collaboration that you, as she directed choreographer and you yeah. writer, also Lincoln Center, you guys did Happiness. Yeah. And what's so interesting about that piece, again, it's from a writer's standpoint, is she and I were talking about this she said that one of the things that you do that's quite different than a lot of other book writers she's worked with is that you will often write things in prose. She says it's really, it speeds the process up, which I was interesting, and she says it's really, really beneficial for your musical collaborators. Yeah, and she said her favorite number in the show is about baseball. Yeah. And, and that they really, in essence, you wrote a short story and they took it and said, oh, well, now we know, now we're liberated enough. We don't have to come up from scratch with this song. It, you know, and actual lines from the prose are in the lyrics. It was, is, yeah, because Michael Corey, who's a brilliant lyricist, is not a baseball fan, I, I yeah. promise you. And, um, you know, I had imagined this moment, which was a, a guy sitting with his father in the best seats they could get at the Polo Grounds for the first game of the 1954 World Series. And the, the his father promised the kid they were going to have seats behind the dugout, and they were withdrawn at the last moment. The guy was a doorman. And I wrote a, 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 a two-and-a-half-page, you could call it a monologue or you could call it that, but the intention was always, Michael said, you know, Give write me some it. parameters. It, you know, Michael and Scott turned it into this ex wonderful song. Yeah. And it was never intended that anybody would say this speech on stage. That's interesting. So when you write that speech, that short story, you know that it's there to simply be transliterated into something else. It's in that never... case, for sure. That's there was, really it was never, there was, I was never gonna hear these words spoken. Yeah. And um, if you don't, if you're not comfortable with that, then you shouldn't write books for musicals, <laughs> do you know? It's like being the lighting designer in, in, in a show. Yeah. Like, the lighting designer gets no love. It doesn't matter how exquisite the lights are, or right. how vital they are. Right. They get no love. It, it depends almost entirely on who you're working with. If you know, if you're if you really respect and admire your collaborators, and if the work they come back with is like what Steve come back, comes back with, and you know he values what you're doing, you know, I, yeah. it it in it, essence it the is experience like, it is of like, making it is the is the reward. That's correct. In my dad's day, people talked about hits and flops. That's how you D described a piece of theater. It was yeah. a hit or it was a flop. And when Assassin's Open, it got the reviews it got from his point of view, it was a flop. I, he didn't mean, oh, it's terrible. It's, yeah. But he was, he was disappointed because it was a flop. But that didn't, it didn't seem to me to be a, a useful or appropriate label. It was like, no, it, it got really bad reviews and I feel bad. I'm not going <laughs> to pretend I don't. But it's, I don't know what it means to say it's a, it's a flop. It's a, it's terminology from a different experience, not the experience I was having. Something that's interesting to me, looking at all of your shows, is that you basically don't do adaptations. That your almost entire body of work is yeah. original work, and that really does stand out against the, sort of the grain of musical theater writers. Has that been on purpose? I think you know, despite the fact that I've worked entirely in the musical theater. I mean, I, I think I have an authorial instinct, mm. which is that if you look, most of the stuff I've done comes from someplace that's important to me. 
so that taking something that somebody else has done, particularly if they've done it well, and doing it again in a, as a musical is less, much less interesting to me than starting from, you know, uh, scratch. So you did adapt big. Yeah. yeah. Right. And that was huge production, but also separate from the quality of the writing, quality of the music, did not go over well. Enough. Yeah, I mean, it was, I'm not going to go back to the labels I rejected earlier, yeah. but labels that in certain situations do apply. I mean, the show was, was, the reason to do the show was to have a hit. And what we had was not a hit. I mean, and it's, it, it gets done now, and there have been other productions, and I think we all did a good job. But, you know, it, when I look back on it, um, I'm back to the, sort of the original ideas which we discussed. I thought yeah. it's a really good film. I think that what it aims for, it delivers it, with, with um, real emotional impact. And I think probably, with hindsight, it would have been better to just leave it alone. You know, there are good musicals that are made from really successful movies. But in terms of the time and attention that was devoted to it, um, uh, I'm, I'm not sure I would, I would do it again. I just feel like talking about when it doesn't work is important because everyone, we all live in this strange profession where everyone assumes everybody always, always succeeds and we're the only ones that don't <laughs> have, have issues with that. Right. So it, for you as a writer, when it doesn't go well, what do you do? Because it's tough. It is. It is tough. And you know. And you know. Uh, there may be people who say, "Well, you know, I die back and I lose myself in my next project." And liars. So, yeah, I think they are liars. liars. You know, I think that um, the, I've worked with really talented, successful people. Um, the 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 rapidity with which insecurity rises to the top in all of us is to me is still staggering. It's like, oh my God, it's, it, they're right, it is no good, I can't do it anymore, I'm never gonna be able to do it again, I should stop now. Is there a way that you, when you get knocked, when you get the wind out of your sails, that, that you get back on the horse? To use that tired, you know, hoary analogy, or is I it have just a matter great, of time? I have a great family. My kids are kind of grown up now. Yeah. But, I, you know, I, I felt that hanging around with my wife and my kids was, oh, it was, I know this sounds like nonsense, but it really is kind of a way to, to put things in perspective. perspective. It makes total sense. Sooner or later, you, you, you wind up back inside. So you have to keep doing the work. The only thing worse than writing is not writing. Yeah, yeah. So finally, it's just more miserable you not to You can't wait till you feel yeah. better. And now, now I'll sit down and start again. Uh, the no. only way to feel better is to you start, and then one day you go, oh, look, I'm in the middle of this, and I like it. I think yeah. that's pretty yeah. true. And let's talk also about Roadshow, because that's, yeah. I mean, that's just the sort of epic, the way you and Steve kept pushing it up the hill and pushing it up, and you know, and ended up in a really interesting place. Steve had always been fascinated by this guy, Wilson Meisner, who was a kind of a, a man about town in New York in the 20s and 30s. He, he was clearly an enormously intelligent, entertaining, amusing guy. And Steve had, had been interested in him for years, Steve called me one day and he said, you ever heard of Wilson Meisner? I said, no. He said, well, there's a book about him. Do you, uh, I said, yeah, absolutely, I'll read it. So I read the book about Wilson and his brother Addison. They were the central figures in yeah. this piece. And Steve's take on Wilson was that he was a guy with so many talents that he, that he couldn't figure which one to focus on. And so his life kind of dribbled away. And when I read the book, my take on these brothers was different. It was as interesting to me as initially as the brothers was the American landscape behind them. It's interesting. When you, so when you're collaborating with, with Steve, for example, and going with this issue of collaboration, and he says, I'm, got, I'm interested and this is how I see the story. And you say, yeah, yeah, I, I, but this is how what interests me. Then what is the next step between well, you? Well, part of, and I think one of the reasons why it took so long to finish the show is because we were really good friends. We are. And we really liked each other and we respected each other. And we never had the kind of important disagreement that we should have had early on. I think I felt like, well, yeah, no, we'll, we'll work on it, we'll start to write, and we'll, it'll come together, it'll, it will wind up on the same page, yeah. sort of by creating pages. And so we went away and we, we, we did a rewrite, we did a rewrite, and then we did a reading and it wasn't quite right yet, and then we talked about who might direct it if there was gonna be a next step. And that's when we wound up talking to, we sent it to John Doyle. The yeah. first thing he said to me was, would you do me a favor? He said, would you send me a copy of the script and just take out all the stage directions? Just take out everything except the most fundamental 
Wilson enters, yeah. Addison exits. And um, I, I looked at what I had written, and it was like, oh, I could like sort of see it that's with more the, clarity. That's what it is. Yeah. And then, then he, he said, would you mind if I just like mark what I think would work as cuts? And I said, no, go ahead. He wasn't saying, here's the script. I cut it. Here it yeah, is. Yeah. Either we're going to do this or I'm, I'm going back to Nottingham or wherever the <laughs> hell it comes from. You know, um, and um, that process uh, continued with him. But he's, he was really good at requiring you to be strict with yourself in terms of what's on the page and what you're delivering. You know, in the musical theater, the director can become um, much more involved as a co-creator than is true with a play. If you have confidence in the person you're working with, you trust them the way I had confidence in John and, and trusted John, then that that back and forth, that that exchange, that, yeah, go ahead, try it, but also knowing when to say no, becomes a, a, a really important and satisfying part of the process. Yeah. If that's not happening, then you've got a whole, this whole different right. thing is going on. Well, he said something quite lovely, John, about you also. He said, you know, I think that what John has to demonstrate to younger writers is how to be a collaborator. He said, I think it's a skill that and I think it is a skill that you that you have, and that 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 everyone. And whenever I've worked with anyone, so it's like you know that's the one skill that is so necessary that doesn't really get enough shrift. It you know as I say, I, I've been very fortunate my collaborators, and that's helped. But you know I've also had conversations with people who are close friends of mine who are describing what's going on yeah. in, a, in a particular collaboration. And you're like, yeah. well, it's like what <laughs> you know? Yeah. It's like no, you what? don't do that. Yeah. You, you know you're you're you're. But never mind cutting off your nose to spite your face. I mean, yeah. you know, you can't you you can't have those kinds of relationships and expect a, you anything know, good. The, to the come idea out. of you know the the Yankee locker room in which you know everybody hates everybody else and you know that's maybe that works in baseball, but I honestly I do not believe it works in the theater. I just don't believe it. Yeah, I completely agree with you on that. Yeah. Are there any? White Whales for you? Any shows that you've always wanted to do that you're really still pining to do? Or, or, or I'm still trying to catch up with White Whales used as a metaphor. <laughs> for, well, you know. Given the way Moby Dick ends, <laughs> and, and maybe it, Yeah, it's true. That's true. I, I think you have me on that one. I'll tell you the truth. I still would like to, and I do think it's a musical because I think it, it, it wants that size. Uh, the Paris Peace Conference, which was the beginning of the end of the world. It's a great idea. Still seems to me to be a really good idea. I mean, you know, yeah, I just thought... Wow, this is amazing. What happened in Paris, the incredible mistakes that were made. Staggering. This collection and this collection of personalities at the top of the Hemingway iceberg, Woodrow Wilson and Clemenceau and Lloyd George. And, you know, I mean, it's like Ho Chi Minh was a busboy at the Ritz Hotel who tried to get credentials to represent Vietnam. I mean, it's just, just the costume, just the clothes right away. You know, and it feels like it. it's really worthy material and... Um, well, here I go, I'm talking about it. I would love to see you do that. Yeah, it's always sort of back to this, the size of the Great White Hope as a yeah. play, but it feels to me, this just feels like the, like, you know, it feels musical to me. <laughs> <laughs>